Hello, it's um, T with the Druid 109. Uh, Philip Cargomi here. Just get the settings right. How are you? Are you there? That's the big question. Uh, one person has arrived and slowly into the forest clearing, more and more people will come. Daniel from Germany. Hi there. Great to see you. So it's lovely to see you on this um, this January day, and uh, in Britain and maybe in other parts of Europe as well. Maybe in Scotland, I see this. There's people coming in from Scotland and uh, and Holland and Germany and California. Uh, we've had a we've had a wonderful time and with wonderful sunshine, and the snowdrops are out already, which is really early. I even saw some daffodils today, some early flowering daffodils. So uh, good evening to you. Um, psychoanalysis has been on my mind uh, this week. Um, and as you, as you know, it was, it was brought to us by Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. And he came up with all sorts of interesting theories, but some rather strange theories as well. And one day, a fellow, fellow analyst, younger than him, appeared, whose name was Carl Jung. And for a long time, they got on very well together. They were big buddies, and uh, they had a great time. And in fact, Freud, um, who developed, the pioneered the idea of working with the couch, used to psychoanalyze his, his mate um, Jung, his student Jung, uh, who would lie on the couch, and, um, you know, the technique where he'd sit at one end of the couch and would listen to everything that he was saying. He was a giant of a man. He was, he was huge. Uh, and the patient would sit there and he would listen to every, every word that, that the client was saying, that Jung was saying. And he developed his theories. And um, one of his big things was the influence of the father. And of course, in the end, uh, well, we probably know what happened with between him and, and, and Jung and Freud, and they fell out. And um, I've been thinking about my father recently, and <laughs> the various explosions occurring. These, by the way, just to give fair credit to where, where credit is due, uh, they, these are produced by the Unemployed Philosophers Guild, a wonderful group of people in the States. And they produce um, not only big uh dolls like this which somebody gave me a few years ago and i've been longing to use it in these uh broadcasts for years uh they also produce what they call magnetic personalities because these little fellas not only are finger puppets um but are magnetic as well so you can you can have them on your fridge so even the couch is magnetic so i guess you can you can i haven't tried yet but i suppose they can they you can have freud lying on a couch in your um kitchen and uh, there's even his daughter, who was a famous uh, child analyst, Anna Freud, um, who I once saw speak in London, actually. So um, these, these puppets are just crying out to be used. And um, here they are. So Freud pioneered this understanding of the influence of the, the, of the father and the mother, of course, in psychoanalysis. And I realized this morning when I woke up, that one of the most annoying characteristics of my father uh, that I have inherited, and it was a humbling moment, but then a redeeming moment, because what I found with my parents was that they talked incessantly, absolutely incessantly. And it used to drive me nuts as a kid because I was always trying to get in the way, sort of get between them. Uh, you know, how can we do this? I was trying to get between them uh, to try and get my own word in edgeways. And um, the thing about speech and talking is, for me, is I don't want it to go around in circles. I want it to take me up or take me down or take me deeper inside. That's why, you know, when you listen to things like, you know, um, Radio 1 or something like that, the BBC, there's so much chatter. I feel that last night I watched some slow television. And I think they should have slow radio as well, where there's just silence on a radio show. And in a way, if you think about it, 
that's what we do in these tea with the druid sessions it's a bit of slow live facebook so i'll chat away for 10 minutes and then we'll have a bit of quiet and slowness and um Maria Sophia Lundgren. I well, I, I'm sorry to hear you're feeling depressed. Let's let's hope the tea does does lift you up. Um, because here's the thing: the redeem taking. Be interesting. I mean, try this experiment. Think, and it may you know it may not work for you, and it may not be universal. But I but I just think it's so interesting to think about. Perhaps one of the most annoying characteristics of your parents: have you inherited them? is the first question can you you know the sort of the ultimate insult when stephanie and i really want to get at each other we will say you know you're just like your mother or you're just like your father and we lob that as the final lob in an argument you're just like your father um so that's the first question how much like your father are you and then the second question is is there a gift hidden away in there is there a nugget uh a jewel and um what I realized is there were if there, if there was a nugget um, when I go to see my mother who's 96 now in little old people's home around the corner she'll sometimes recite poetry and sure she'll go round and round as old people often do but she's also capable of suddenly coming up with the most beautiful poetry that she's remembered uh, by heart and uh, she recites it to me and so I, I realized that's that's what I want um i've i've inherited this kind of gift of the gab as they say your fingers now look naked somebody says i put them back on clothe dress your fingers at once um so um <laughs> so so um you know i want my words to be meaningful and i guess i suppose that's what's driven me and when i write and when i talk i try to uh make the words meaningful and I try to be decent and wear, wear clothes on my fingers so they're not naked. And somehow these, um, these ideas, well, this helped me to resolve really the problem of waking up on a Monday morning thinking, my God, it's tea with a druid tonight. What are we going to talk about? Uh, so the way, the way words can lift us up, can bring us down, you know, that's the problem in a way, isn't it, with watching too much television, is unless you choose the right programs, the words can bring you down. You know, literally, they, they can make you feel depressed. Uh, and the art is to, I think, is to be realistic and to be able to deal with reality and what's happening in the world and the news and so on, but also to understand that language is magical. And that's, after all, why we're interested in magic, I guess, most of us, is because we know that words have power. Which leads me to our journey today. And you know how uh, after about 10 minutes, I uh, guide a meditation for about 10 minutes. That's the way these teas work. And then uh, if you want a longer journey, we've set up something called the Private Magicians Club. And uh, once a month, there's a nice long journey, uh, as well as the conviviality and the opportunity to ask questions and so on, live Facebook sessions. Um, and the way to get to the Private Magicians Club is through either the Lessons in Magic course or the Transformation Through Tarot course. And you can find details of that in, in, on my website. Um, but what I want to talk to you, what I, the journey I want to lead us on today is a different one from the one we normally take. It's taken from this book that I was told about called The Guidebook for an Armchair Pilgrimage. Uh, photos and designs by John Schott and the text written by Phil Smith and Tony Whitehead. And uh, it's really very unusual. When I first ordered it, um, I thought it would be working with the ideas of armchair pilgrimage that I've talked about in uh, the Book of English Magic and Sacred Places. People are always rather rude about armchair magicians or armchair uh, pilgrimage even. You know, the, the, the real people go out and do this stuff. Well, with um, as you get older, 
sometimes that's not uh, possible. Sometimes it's not practical. Sometimes you don't have the money to do it or the possibility to do it. And now with, with uh, being, having to be conscious of your carbon footprint, sometimes it's not a good idea to do it. So I, I've advocated the idea of um, armchair pilgrimages using meditation, visualization, and the internet actually to stimulate your connection with a sacred site. And uh, in the Book of English Magic, I talk about how magic can be done from an armchair as well which is why in the Private Magicians Club, we have extremely comfortable armchairs that we work our magic in. But this turns out to be a very different book indeed. It's a book that invites you to spend 19 days, which can be consecutive days or um, with gaps, where you read some text and then look at some photographs and it takes you on a journey. And it's a real journey that the authors did in the Devon countryside, uh, but it's a journey you can take from everywhere because the authors are psychogeographers. And I thought for our journey tonight, let me read you a section and show you the pictures. And just enjoy the language. And my, I opened it at random, asking for the right page. And I found myself on day seven where... Um, the the journey has taken us to the um, Morris dancers. What are they? Oh, their, their their name has suddenly jumped out of my mind. I can't remember. They they they're, they're all dressed up in black, and uh, they have extraordinary hats that they wear, um, and uh, they do these incredible performances. We get them in Lewis. Uh, Dave the Bard invites them to do their performances in uh, at some of his events too, and it's powerful stuff. So, so just sit back and enjoy, and I hope you enjoy the language of this. The dancers and the things their dances bring. You feel the drumbeat. Below the great hill, night falls hard and fast. How many pints of the dream a brew will set you free? Baron Samedi, voodoo boss, smiles your way, his face cracked, skin drawn brilliant white over a death skull. The beat quickens, rag figures appear, grease black faces and blacker lips, white eyes startling in the gloom. Excited by the wildness of this apparently ancient dance, its shared history with the drawer of the old hill and the conviviality of the dancers, holding their glasses so the beer and cider swills to the step of the jig. You are pilgrim here. Buoyed up on the excitement outside the pub, beside the village green, you feel as though you might effortlessly float up to the top of the hill on the crow's wings of the black costumed dancers. Watch them through the distorting lens of your smeared glass, almost empty now. The dreamer at work, collapsing past and future. Dismantling the firmness of boundaries that might shore your stumbling ego against the beat. Sit outside the country alehouse, the sky darkening above the looming great hill. What is undoing you? Put down this book for a moment. What does undo you? Whether for good or bad, what is it that loosens you? The wild and honest cavort of the black-faced Morris dancers, trespassers and poachers is still roiling like dark and oily waves. Is that why you feel so strange? Or was it the sensual sophistication of the garden? Did its liaison of subtle forms and a fine taste for desire unsettle you? Which is easiest to admit to yourself? The fiddle player grinds his strings. The shining crosswomen begin a new dance, 
rags fly outwards, feet leave the ground, feathers trail from blacktop hats. A single quill flutters through the cold night air and settles in the gutter. Sticks crash together and coarse yells echo up into the darkening sky and tremble among the boughs of the distant hilltop copse. Waking sprites and elementals who now pour down the hill to join in with the human throng. More dreamer, more dreamer. What's that on the edge of the circle? What's real here? From a far distant distance, from the edges of what is holy, darkening silence approaches. Absolute silence in a shuffling pack, its surging awkwardness and toothsome snarls muffled by the falling cloak of night. This is the great unsounding that marks the end of things. Beer, village greens, memory, love, communion, and life. The nothing that neither affirms nor denies, the great dark light that just is and is not, allowing no opposite. Here it is in the swirl of the coal black dance you meet the darkness and now you are dancing blindly and burning darkly. At each turn feel how another citadel of your certainty collapses in a rain of ashes. Sense how you are crumbling now the whole city and multitude of you, dropping through the green into the black, into the timeless da dance of the glassy something smear on the cracks appear and then disappear with whatever they were cracks in. Time melts, a fierce white flame. You are lost. And then you turn the page and there is blackness. You turn the page and more blackness. Turn the page and more blackness. And then, sorry, surfacing day nine. So you were on day seven and now you're on day nine. Day eight has disappeared. And so it goes on, this beautiful book. There you go. Guidebook for an armchair pilgrimage. John Schott, Phil Smith, Tony Whitehead. And you can find it on Amazon. So let me look at, I'm just, just seeing these comments now. Oh great, Beth Amos has really framed, reframed her parents' gifts. Her gifts of hypochondria from her dad and um, OCD from her mum. Uh, hypochondria makes her sensitive to, to being in good health and OCD gives her an attention to detail. That's lovely. Um, great, yes. And of course it's not gonna apply to everybody, but, um, uh, but, but, but it's really worth considering, I think. Um, I think what's so interesting is, you know, um, it's easy to mock Freud or to criticize him. And there's a hell of a lot to criticize Freud's, Freud about. Um, but we've moved on now and, you know, and, and there was this progression, if you like, Freud opened the door and then, and then Jung came along and, uh, you know, and um, most of us probably prefer the Jungian approach to the Freudian approach. Um, but, but let me know who you prefer. And then beyond Jung, of course, you've got people like um, Asagioli, the founder of psychosynthesis, and uh, other people who are involved in transpersonal psychology. So thank you for listening to me. And I'm going to thank the spirit of our, our meetings together. This is a kind of druid idea, I guess, or a spiritual idea that that something that seems to be rational and logical, which is uh, a weekly get together on the internet. But what you do with druidry is you is you is you render you bring in consciousness into it, and you, and you thank 
So I'm going to thank the spirit of Tea with a Druid. Tea with a Druid now, after two years, it's become a thing in itself that has a life, uh, a life of its own uh, that other people can, that we all contribute to. It's a group effort. I'm kind of focalizing it for most Mondays, but not every Monday. Other people are. Thank you so much to Ben Hopkinson uh, giving us your very uh, touching uh, broadcast from Australia where you're going through such a lot. Um, and uh, and I'd like to thank the spirit of, of Tea with a Druid and everybody who participates in it uh, because it helps me, it helps me to inspire me, uh, find ideas to talk about and think more deeply about subjects, which is one of the points of it. So um, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea and come back and um, read these uh, quotes. I should, I'll, I'll put a link to the book up for you and maybe I'll find one for the Unemployed Philosophers Guild as well. And um, good night to everybody. Have a have a or good morning if it's the morning for you. And good night from uh, all these little little friends and uh, the big friend too. Okay. Good night. <laughs>